Section 7 of Dwarf Fruit Trees. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunganunkataha, Pew. Dwarf Fruit Trees by Frank Albert Waugh. 7. Dwarf Apples. Dwarf apples are the most interesting and valuable of dwarf fruits. We have become so thoroughly accustomed to the standard apple tree in this country, however, and it so fully meets all the apparent requirements, that there seems to be no call for dwarf apples. Nevertheless, dwarf trees have some real advantages under certain circumstances. Some of these have already been pointed out in the general discussion in previous chapters, and some of them will bear reiteration here. Where so much interest is taken in apple culture as in America, the advantage which dwarf trees offer for rapid testing of new varieties cannot be overlooked. Still, more important is the value of the dwarf trees in producing extra fancy specimens. Thus, in growing very fine apples for exhibition, or for a particularly fastidious market, one would naturally choose the dwarf trees. Inasmuch as dwarf trees are recommended chiefly to the amateur and are grown generally less for cash profit than for other considerations, the great and obvious advantages of standard trees quickly disappear. For men who like to play at fruit growing, nothing can equal a selection of apples on paradise stocks. They are the most engaging of all dwarf trees, in fact, of all fruit trees whatsoever. The general matter of selecting stocks has been referred to under the head of propagation, but the statement should be repeated here that the French paradise stock is preferable for very dwarf garden trees and is almost necessary for cordons and espaliers, while the docin, sometimes called the English or broad-leaved paradise, may be chosen where only moderate amounts of dwarfing is desired. Some of the most expert apple growers of North America are beginning to think that the docin may be required for the commercial orchards in the future, when spraying for the San Jose scale becomes an established routine and smaller trees are an accepted necessity. Dwarf apple trees may be cultivated in nearly all the artificial forms ever given to fruit trees. Undoubtedly, the simplest is the bush or vase form. This requires less care and attention and probably gives as much fruit to the same area as any other. The pyramid form is somewhat difficult to produce. It can be secured successfully only with the varieties which have a tendency to grow strong, straight branches, as for instance Sutton, Gravenstein, and Northern Spy. On the whole, the pyramid is not to be recommended for dwarf apples. Apples succeed very well as upright cordons and in all the simpler modifications of this form. As these trees can be planted very close together, as close as 15 inches certainly, thus occupying very little room, a large number of them can be planted in very limited areas of the city lot or backyard. They are especially adapted to stand on the property line where they seem to use no space whatever and where in fact they do occupy space which otherwise would be lost. The upright cordon can be bent into the form of an arch in order to make delightful arbors along the walks. The illustration figure 2 shows a good example of this sort. Figure 25. Dwarf apples on Professor L. H. Bailey's farm, New York. Photograph of the view looking down a wide dirt alley into the distance, with mature dwarf apples showing vigorous new growth following along the alley on either side. Nearly all varieties of apples, indeed all as far as I know, succeed in this form. The trees are not very long-lived, however. That is, they cannot be maintained in good presentable form and prolific bearing indefinitely, because it is difficult to reproduce the fruit spurs on the lower part of the stem. Nevertheless, the trees are inexpensive and can be cheaply replaced. As they come into bearing the first or second year after planting, this task of replacing worn-out trees is a small one. Very fine specimens of fruit can be produced on these upright cordons. Indeed, this form is superior to the bush form in this respect. The apple is the best of all trees for horizontal cordons. In this form it becomes the most entertaining plaything in the garden, as well as one of the most rewarding trees in its product of fruit. Either the single arm or the double arm cordon can be used with success. These horizontal cordons are naturally used along the borders of walks, flower beds, or plots devoted to vegetables. They may sometimes be used along foundations of buildings, where it is not desired to grow upright cordons or espaliers against the walls. 
The fruit produced by horizontal cordons is probably superior in size, color, and finish to that produced on any other form of tree. In climates where the summer's heat and sunshine are apt to be meager, this advantage of the horizontal cordon will be comparatively greater. Conversely, it will be less in places where sunshine and heat are very abundant during the summer. It is probably true that on the plains of Arizona and Texas, the horizontal cordon will not be a brilliant success. Dwarf apples need practically the same care and cultivation, aside from pruning, as standard apples. The soil should be cultivated during the early part of the summer and allowed to rest during the latter part of the year. Cover crops may be sown during June or July, according to the customs practiced in the usual orchard management, but the advantages of a cover crop in a small garden are less material than in a large commercial orchard. Figure 26. Upright cordon apples. 18 inches apart, in the author's garden. Photograph of the author's three-year-old daughter standing next to and inspecting one of several upright cordons in full bloom. The formation of the tree is discussed under another head. It remains to be said only that careful and intelligent pruning are required to keep any dwarf apple tree to its work. The more complicated and the more restricted the form of the tree, the more careful and continuous must be this pruning. The general system may be outlined in comparatively few words and may be explained in its simplest form as applied to the treatment of a horizontal cordon. Each horizontal cordon, perfectly formed and full-grown, should have fruit spurs throughout its horizontal length, which may be from 3 to 15 feet. The upright portion of the trunk, from the point where the graft is set to the angle made by the bending down of the stem, should be kept clean and bare. Constant care is required to remove the sprout from this portion of the tree, especially such as come from the stock. At the further end of the horizontal portion, there should be one, two, or three strong shoots allowed to push forth each year. These may be called leaders. They represent the principal wood growth in each tree. They draw up the sap from the roots, their leaves elaborate this sap, and from them the digested material is sent back for the support of the tree and the ripening of the fruit. They are allowed to take an upright or nearly upright position, and their growth is encouraged. On all other portions of the tree, growth is sternly restricted, when not altogether repressed. There is a constant tendency for strong shoots to start into growth all along the horizontal part of the stem, and especially near the bend. If any of these shoots are allowed to make headway, the form of the tree is spoiled. Even if they are cut out after a year's growth, thus retaining somewhat the form of the tree, the fruit spurs are thereby lost. It is the business of the fruit grower, therefore, to pinch back these shoots which start along the horizontal stem, and this pinching is done at a comparatively early stage of their growth. Usually, the first pinching should be given when the stems have grown long enough as to have seven or eight leaves. These shoots are then cut or pinched back to three leaves. If the tree is in good vigorous condition, these shoots will soon start into growth once more. Again, they have to be pinched. This time, the pinching comes a little earlier, taking the shoot when it reaches only about five leaves, and the pinching is still more severe. The shoots may start into growth a third time or even a fourth time, but each time they are pinched back sooner and more severely than before. In most cases, two or three pinchings will suffice. These constant repressions of growth tend to secure the formation of fruit spurs and fruit buds along the horizontal trunk of the tree. Some slight modifications of the plan here outlined will develop themselves in experience. In particular, it will be found that different varieties require slightly different handling. Some form fruit spurs more readily than others. With certain varieties, it is very difficult to repress the rampant habit of growth and to secure a proper formation of fruit buds. These differences, however, are of minor importance as compared with the general management of the tree. The system just outlined has in view the summer pruning of the horizontal cordon apple. The upright cordon is pruned in almost exactly the same manner. Various forms of espaliers are handled in much the same way. Strong shoots or leaders are allowed to grow at the ends of the main branches to keep up proper circulation and elaboration of sap, while the growth of fruit spurs is encouraged along the sides of the stems by frequent and regular pruning. In a somewhat less precise manner, the same system of pruning can be applied to bush and pyramid forms. Each bush, for instance, is made up of a certain number of fruiting branches. The fruit is borne on spurs on the sides of these branches, 
while the woody growth is made by the leaders appearing at the ends of these branches. These leaders are annually cut back, and the constant formation of fruit spurs is encouraged by pinching whatever shoots are on the sides of the main stems. It will be seen that the whole business of pruning falls into two general categories, viz. winter pruning and summer pruning. The winter, or spring pruning, is given any time after the stress of winter is over and before the sap starts running in the spring. This is the time when ordinary fruit trees are customarily pruned. The work at this season consists chiefly in cutting back leaders. These are pruned off short. That is, the whole stem is taken off down to within two or three buds of where it started growth the previous year. In some cases, it is worthwhile to cut back even further, going into wood two or three years old. At this spring pruning, the defective or diseased branches are of course removed wherever they are found. Cases requiring such treatment always occur even on the best trained cordons and espaliers. Whenever it becomes necessary, an entire branch, sometimes composing half the tree, is taken out. Usually such branches can be replaced without great loss of time. Figure 27. Horizontal Cordon Apple Trees Photograph of the author's daughter, wearing the same dress and hair ribbons as in the previous figure, though now posing with horizontal cordon apple trees, also in full bloom. The row of trees stretches off into the distance from the bottom right to the top left. After this winter or spring pruning comes the summer pruning, which has been outlined above. This usually begins May 15th through the 25th, and continues until July 25th through the 31st, differing, of course, in different latitudes. Practically all varieties of apples can be grown as dwarfs, though some succeed on paradise roots better than others. Some varieties are also better adapted for special forms, as for cordons, than are others. Such requirements are not very strict, and a careful gardener can grow practically anything he wants to. Patrick Berry, in his Fruit Garden, recommends 20 very large and beautiful sorts for dwarfs, having in mind American conditions and especially his own experience in Rochester, New York. His list is as follows. Red Astrakhan, Large Sweet Bow, Primate, Beauty of Kent, Alexander, Duchess of Oldenburg, Fall Pippin, William's Favorite, Gravenstein, Hawthornden, Maiden's Bush, Porter, Menagerie, Red Bietischheim, Bailey Sweet, Canada Rennet, Northern Spy, Mother, King of Tompkins County, 20 Ounce, Wagner. In Europe, where greater attention has been paid to these matters, the opinion has settled down to a comparatively limited number. For example, Mr. George Bunyard in The Fruit Garden recommends the following varieties for cordons. Mr. Gladstone, August. Devonshire, Quarendon, August. James Grieve, September. Wealthy, October. Margill, October. King of Pippins, October. Duchess of Oldenburg, August. Potts Seedling, September. Lord Grosvenor, September. Adams Pearmain, December. Hubbard Pearmain, December. Allington Pippin, November, February. Scarlet Nonpareil, January, February. Norman's Pippin, January. Lord Burley, February. Duke of Devonshire, February. Rosemary Russet, February. Strummer Pippin, very late. Allen's Everlasting, very late. Mother, October. Cauville Rouge Precoce, October. Cox's Orange Pippin, October, February. St. Edmund's Pippin, November. Ross Nonpareil, November. Fern's Pippin, very late. Lord Derby, November. Bismarck, December. Lane's Prince Albert, January, March. Lord Suffield, September. Grenadier, September, October. Golden Spire, September, October. Seton House, September, October. Sandringham, February. Alfriston, February, March. Cauville Malangre, February to March. Cauville Rouge, February to March. The same authority recommends the following varieties to be grown on paradise stocks as bushes. Beauty of Bath, July, August. Red Quarendon, July, August. Lady Suddily, September. Worcester Pearmain, September, October. Yellow Angustry, 
September. Duchess's favorite, September to October. King of Pippins, October. Early White Transparent, July. Lord Suffield, August, September. Pot Seedling, August, September. Lord Grosvenor, August, September. Early Julian, August, September. Ecklinville Seedling, September, October. Grenadier, September, October. Sterling Castle, September, October. Golden Spire, September, October. Cox Orange Pippin, November, February. Beauty of Barnack, November. Allington Pippin, December, February. Gascoigne's Scarlet, December. Christmas Pearmain, December. Winter's Quarendon, December. Bauman's Rennet, January. Lord Derby, October, November. Stone's Apple, October, November. Tower of Glamis, October, November. Warner's King, October, November. Bismarck, October, November. Lane's Prince Albert, December, March. Bramley's Seedling, December, March. Newton's Wonder, December, March. Max Loebner in his book on dwarf fruits recommends the following varieties for dwarf apples. Red Astrakhan, July, August. Yellow Transparent, August, September. Charlemowski, August, September. Transparent de Concelles, September, October. Prince Apple, September, January. Danzig, October, December. Dean's Codlin, October to February. Landbury Rennet, November, February. Cox's Orange, November to March, requires good soil. Winter Gold, November. Pearmain, March. Ribston Pippin, November, April. Good warm soil. Canada Rennet, November, April. Hardy. Bella de Boscope, November, May. Virginia Rose, August. Red Peach Summer Apple, August, September. Lord Suffield, August, October. Cellini, September, November. Alexander, October, December. Gravenstein, October to January. For moist soils, bears late. Yellow Richard, November, December. Bismarck, November, February. Yellow Bellflower, November to April. Requires good position. Bauman's Rennet, December, May. Inasmuch as the advantages of the dwarf trees apply especially to the growing of fine fruit, only the better varieties should generally be propagated in this way. On this basis, therefore, rather than on the basis of adaptation learned from experience, the following varieties may be suggested among the well-known American sorts for growing in dwarf form. Baldwin, Esopus, Mother, William's Favorite, Sutton, King, Northern Spy, Grimes, Winesap, Yellow Transparent, Macintosh, Red Astrakhan, Alexander, Wolf River, Ribston's Pippin, Wealthy, Wagner. Of course, one propagating dwarf apples would always select his own favorites. It should be noticed that in the list given above are some varieties which are notable for beauty of appearance rather than for superior quality. They are recommended on the former consideration. Certain varieties in the list, for instance Alexander, are known to succeed especially well as dwarfs. End of seven. Recording by Ian Bradford, Nunga Nunga Taha, Pew.